goal of the conference is to bring machine learning and computational neuroscience back together again. Uh, a lot of the uh, major insights in deep learning and artificial intelligence came from neuroscience. In fact, you could, you could basically say that almost all of them. There has been a lot of interest in the computational neuroscience community in bringing machine learning and AI back on board. But the other direction has yet to be fully recouped. So that direction of taking inspiration from the brain to build better AI systems is precisely the gap that I think we wanted to fill with this conference and, and which is arguably still a gap. I mean, I, I feel like this, this neuro AI is as fundamental as, you know, physics or chemistry. It's, you know, the study of intelligence, perception, all of these, you know, there, there's certainly like fads, I mean, in, in how you analyze data using neural networks and so on, that's all true. But um, yeah, the fundamental quest to understand intelligence, I don't see how that can be called a fad. This is Brain Inspired. Step right up, folks, and get your tickets. That's right, get your tickets to the NISIS conference this year. (laughs) Hello, everyone. It's Paul. NISIS stands for From Neuroscience to Artificially Intelligent Systems. This is a conference held at Cold Spring Harbor, where the goal, as you'll hear Tony Zador say, is to bring together the machine learning world and the neuroscience world with a particular focus on how neuroscience can help inform machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I had noticed that the deadline to submit abstracts and to get your tickets to uh, join the conference uh, is coming up. Actually, it's uh, January 21st right after the release of this podcast. So I thought it would be fun to have the three organizers of the conference this year on the podcast just to have a broad conversation about their interests and topics related to the conference and neuroAI in general. Dora Sow is a new voice on the podcast. She runs her lab at UC Berkeley, and she's interested in how our brains form invariant representations of objects. And you could say she's uh, well-known already for her work studying face patch areas uh, in the cortex in non-human primates uh, and in humans. Blake Richards uh, is at McGill University. Uh, The last time he was on the podcast, we talked about largely his work um, figuring out how backpropagation or uh, something like backpropagation might be implemented in brains. And in this discussion, uh, we talk about his more recent interests, for example, figuring out how uh, multiple streams of representations can be combined to help us generalize better. And Tony Zador is at Cold Spring Harbor. And the last time he was on the podcast, uh, we focused on his paper, uh, A Critique of Pure Learning, in which he makes the case that uh, we need to pay more attention to evolution and the innate uh, structures and abilities that organisms come into the world with. And during our discussion, we revisit Uh, the ideas from Tony's paper uh, and use it as a springboard to talk about development uh, and learning and how these processes could be considered one kind of continuous optimization process. And in general, we have kind of a wide-ranging discussion about many of the issues that are relevant to the NISIS conference. So I encourage you to uh, go to the NISIS website, which you can find in the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 125 and consider whether it may be of interest of you to attend this year or another year. Thank you for listening and enjoy. So I thought we would just start um, not so much by giving an introduction of yourselves, but maybe you you guys can talk each about something that uh, kept you up last night that you're thinking about scientifically. I know that there are many things that keep people up uh, these nights, but uh, in the science realm, something that you're working on that's just at the uh, edge of your knowledge. Tony, would you want to uh, lead us off? Sure. Um, well, so my life is pretty diverse. So what keeps me up one night um, isn't necessarily what keeps me up the, the second night. Uh, I don't get a lot of sleep at all. But most recently, what, what has been keeping me up is uh, we've been working on applying uh, some ideas about the genomic bottleneck to reinforcement learning. 
And we've been trying to figure out how we can compress the, the networks that we use for reinforcement learning by a couple orders of magnitude and see if that can uh, give us better generalization, uh, better transfer learning. And so there's a lot of, a lot of exciting stuff going on there. But um, that, that's sort of at the, at the edge of what we can do with that. It seems to be working, but there are some, some, some things that aren't quite, quite, quite there yet. So we're pretty excited about that. Well, we're going to come back to that as well. Uh, I have questions about that. All right, great. Uh, Doris, do you want to, uh, wh- what kept you up last night? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about last night, but the question that um, I've been obsessed about for, for a long time now is how the brain solves segmentation. You know, we see our vision is really based on objects and there must be some way that the brain manages to bind all the parts of an object together and track those parts as they move around. And um, whatever the code is, it should be fundamentally different from, you know, anything that we understand right now, because it has to be a dynamic code, right? If the object comes twice as big, like that code has to expand um, somehow. And, you know, in computer vision, people like use colors and you know, what is the analog of like this color label in the brain? So I, I would, you know, kind of give everything to know the answer. And that's one of the big problems we're working on right now. So you're sort of famous for uh, faces, right? Face uh, patch areas uh, in, in brains. But that wasn't your original interest. Your original interest was, was objects. And now you've returned to that. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I got into faces. I joked that it was like this, you know, 20 year detour and now, now I'm doing back to what, what I want to do um, originally, right? My, my first experiment when I was a grad student, I set up monkey fMRI and I showed monkeys pictures of stereograms because I wanted to understand how they represent 3D objects. And then, you know, I read this paper from Nancy Kamish about faces and uh, it seemed like a you know, fun project <laughs> it might not work to, to show monkeys faces and that sort of took, took its own life. A 20 year diversion then, huh? That's, I guess that's how science well, careers I, work. I, I hope that they'll, they'll come together. You know, when we're discovering this base patch system, it's not, it's not really about faces for me. That's not, I don't, I could care less about faces. There's like one part of the brain that I could have lesion. It would probably be my face area. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be so shy. Um, it's, you know, the fa- face patch system is beautiful. Um, we, we call this turtle's underbelly, right? It get, lets us get at the mechanisms for how the brain represents high level objects. And it gives us a, an experimental handle to all kinds of questions related to high-level object representation, you know, including um, one of the questions I assume we're going to be talking about, like unsupervised learning. How, how does the brain learn to recognize, you know, a face um, just from a few observations? And I think that's also going to connect to this tracking and segmentation problem I talked about. So, um, yeah, it's it, the face patch system is a lot more than just about how, how the brain represents faces. Is it a solved issue? I mean, there was controversy, right, of, over whether this particular brain area, uh, speaking of Nancy Kenwisher's work, uh, really is um, representing faces. Is that solved? Is that a, are we done with that? Uh, no, it's, it's not solved. I think we do have a lot more insight into it. And one of the insights has actually come from d- deep networks, right, that came on the scene, I don't know, five or ten years ago. Um, so for the longest time, Nancy's lab and others had discovered these little islands of cortex selected for faces, bodies, and you know, colored objects and other things. And we had replicated this in monkeys. Um, and it was a total mystery if there was any principle governing how all of these regions are organized, right? And there was also islands of surrounding cortex that no one had any idea what they're really doing. And so it was this kind of, yeah, it was a big question mark. And there's, you know, some sense, maybe it's, there is no principle at all, right? This is what you get. And you get some islands of cortex that represent um, things that are understandable and other islands that don't. And then deep networks um, came on the scene and, and my postdoc, Ping Wei Bao, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but he basically, he, he did a very simple analysis. He passed a large number of objects through AlexNet um, and just did principal components analysis on the activations in layer FC6. And then you can just look at the first few principal components and they span an object space. And the amazing thing is that if you look at what's in those different quadrants of that object space, one of the quadrants turns out to be faces. Another quadrant turns out to be things that look like bodies. 
And so, you know, something clicked and it's like, whoa, what if all of IT Cortex is actually laid out according to these two um, axes of object space that you discover with a deep network? And, um, you know, that made a new prediction about a new network that we should find and turn out to exist. So, um, yeah, to first approximation, it seems like IT Cortex is actually laid out like an object space and face patches are one quadrant of that. So, so it's starting to make sense, but I think face patches are also, they, they also are specialized for faces in, in a very strong way, right? You just invert like the contrast of a face, the cell's response goes way down. And a lot of those things can't be explained by, you know, just projection onto this generic object space. So it's still an open question, but we have a lot more insight now. Blake, you, uh, have you figured out, were you up last night thinking about how face patches get learned in brains? <laughs> Um, not specifically, but the thing that's been keeping me up is related to some of this stuff. Um, so uh, one of my big worries right now is the question of how to develop artificial intelligence that can engage in what we call systematic generalization. Mm. So that is not just generalization to unseen data points or even data points that might come from a different distribution, but specifically generalization that obeys some systematicity or some rules, as it were. And humans are pretty good at this, right? So you can look at some puzzle, like I can give you some kind of shape-based analogy where say I show you a square, a triangle and a square, and then I show you a circle, a diamond, and you have to fill in the last one. And you'll immediately kind of detect the rule above. You say, okay, it goes one shape, two shape, back to the first shape. So then you apply it again and immediately you can get the answer. You don't have to see any data points. It just, the rule makes sense to you right away. And this is actually surprisingly hard to get in vanilla artificial neural networks. They don't show this kind of systematic generalization. And the old school answer to what you needed for that was symbol systems. And that's still the answer some people give. But for a variety of reasons, which we can discuss if, if we wish, I've come to the conclusion that I think that systematic generalization doesn't depend on the existence of a symbol system or anything like that. It just depends on the existence of separate representations for static object features in the environment. And on the other hand, relations between objects, be it dynamic movement-based relations or just spatial relations or any other kind of relation. You need this, this distinction between the objects, you rec the objects that you represent and the relationships between them. And those have to be represented by different systems. And if you have these separated um, representations, there's some data coming out of a few labs and, and some preliminary stuff from my lab as well, showing that then if you have these separate representations, you do get systematic generalization. And so then the interesting question for me is how could those separate representations possibly emerge? And this is where we published a recent study showing that um, if you optimize a deep neural network that has two different anatomically segregated streams and you optimize it with an unsupervised loss to do prediction, you'll actually get kind of segregated representations for static object features and movement or relation features. And so this is um, a, a kind of broader interest now for me that ties back into the unsupervised learning question, because basically I'm, I'm starting to think more and more that maybe the way we get to systematic generalization in the brain is by having systems that through evolution or learning in the lifetime have been optimized in such a way that you get separate representations for the relationships between objects and the objects themselves. And I think that once you have those separate representations, now you can get systematic generalization. And the reason is actually pretty simple. It's because systematic generalization depends on you having a sense of there being relations that can be applied to anything, no matter what the object is. And so once you have those separated representations for your relations, that becomes possible. Uh, is hierarchy involved here or because it's the way you described it, it sounds like a, uh, single level, right? So two representations, and then there's some generalization, but is there a hierarchical structure that you're thinking about as well? I mean, you definitely need hierarchy if you're dealing with any kind of complex high-dimensional input. In principle, I think this same 
uh, rule that you need separate representations for your relations and your objects in order to get systematic generalization could even apply in situations where you already have uh, simplified representations that don't require any additional hierarchy to get you what you need. But in 99% of the tasks that we would ever want an AI to do, and certainly for everything the brain does, yes, you need hierarchy because you don't you don't care about, say, pixel level relationships, right? Like you don't care really about what this retinal ganglion cell and this retinal ganglion cell's relationship are to each other. What you care about is the relationship of, say, you know, where is my face relative to this other person's face or something like that. Like th these are the sorts of high level relationships that you care about. And so that requires hierarchy. So I was just reading about induction and deduction and abduction and how humans uh, are so great because we are great uh, abductors, right? We, we perform abductive inference. Is this related at all to that? To that? Uh, forgive me for the naive question. No, I mean, it's definitely related to this stuff because what you could say to some extent is that standard deep neural networks are really good at induction. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of evidence for that at this point in time. And so both deductive and abductive reasoning are arguably still missing. And indeed, when we talk about systematic generalization, that is precisely related to, to these questions. So, uh, Tony, <clears throat> I, know, I know that you hate learning. Uh, we, the last time you were on the podcast... <laughs> Uh, we talked about your paper, a critique of, of pure learning. You mean me personally? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> you you seem incapable. No. The, <clears throat> yeah. But, no, I gave up. <laughs> Too hard. So let's talk about the uh, the conference that's that's coming up. Actually, the deadline to uh, apply and submit abstracts right is just uh, January twenty first, I believe. And so this podcast, I believe so. Yeah, it's coming right up. Yeah, from neuroscience to artificially intelligent systems, NICES. Got it. Well done. <laughs> So uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, I mentioned Tony's paper because uh, it is, um, in some sense, the antithesis of learning. Uh, that's not true, obviously. But um, so you, but the rage these days is using these learning systems, artificial uh, neural networks, deep learning networks. And Doris has already mentioned uh, her work with the unsupervised learning, and Blake uh, just mentioned uh, the same. First of all, what's the conference, and uh, what's the goal of the conference, and then how did uh, someone who uh, is so anti-deep learning networks uh, come to be one of the uh, organizers, and are you the dissenting voice among uh, the, the, the attendees, etc.? Um, well, I'll, I'll start by saying what the, the conference is. The, the, the goal of the conference is to, in some sense, bring machine learning and computational neuroscience back together again. So uh, a lot of the uh, major insights in deep learning and artificial intelligence came from neuroscience. In fact, you could, you could basically say that almost all of them, all of the major advances uh, in artificial intelligence came from uh, looking at neuroscience. So the very idea of formulating the, the uh, question of artificial intelligence as uh, interactions between collections of simple units, which we might be tempted to call neurons, suggest its deep roots, right? And in fact, interestingly, even the von Neumann architecture, which is in some sense the opposite of um, sort of neural network type architectures, even that architecture was an attempt by von Neumann, an explicit attempt by von Neumann to model certain aspects or at least capture certain essential features of how um, the nervous system works. So if you go back to the technical report from I think around 47 or something on the, the first von Neumann computer, he, he devotes an entire chapter to comparing how the architecture that they propose relates to that of um, the brain. Um, and so, you know, convolutional neural networks, um, and the, the ideas of reinforcement learning, um, all of these come from tapping into neuroscience. But, and, and in fact, in the early days, uh, NeurIPS, which was back then called NIPS, uh, was a meeting that drew together both people from uh, machine learning and neural networks and people in computational neuroscience. In fact, they were the same people. I mean, that was the, 
that was the meeting that that was like my go-to meeting when I was a graduate student. It was the only place, the only sort of substantial meeting where you could present computational neuroscience. Um, but by the by the nineties, by the mid nineties, those two fields had sort of diverged to the point where it wasn't really sort of useful to, to have them as one meeting. And nowadays, I think most many, at least many people who work in, in uh, artificial intelligence have sort of lost sight of the fact that any knowledge from, from neuroscience was perhaps anything but, if you like, a, an inspiration or an existence proof. So, you know, to, to hear a lot of modern AI people talk, the, the role of neuroscience in AI is comparable to the, let's say, um, role of birds in um, aeronautics engineering. You know, yes, in, you know, in the beginning, man looked up at flying birds and said, if only we could fly too. But that's where the, the connection stops. But, but of course, that's, that's not really true. So the goal of NISIS is to, to bring these two communities um, back together and have sort of uh, a, a, a get a conversation going again so that, you know, in the event that the current technologies, the current approach is sort of asymptote at some point, which, I, you know, incredible though the advances are, I, I think uh, we still will need new ideas will sort of provide the foundation for those new ideas in this in this meeting. If I if I can add to that too, I think one of the interesting things about the way that it's evolved in recent years is that um, there has been a lot of interest in the computational neuroscience community in bringing machine learning and AI back on board to to kind of do our explorations of the brain, but the other direction has yet to be fully recouped. And so that direction of taking inspiration from the brain to build better AI systems is precisely the gap that I think we wanted to fill with this conference and, and which is arguably still a gap. Because, you know, if you go to Cosine or whatever, you see a lot of deep neural networks, a lot of AI stuff, but they're all addressed at answering questions about the brain. Whereas at NeurIPS, I would say, though there is a growing neuroscience contingent, it's still a, a very small part of it, and it's by no means the the mainstream of the conference. Doris, do you agree with with all of that? So you um, you know you were just talking about using unsupervised learning models to inform the neuroscience, which, like Blake was just saying, is the uh, general trend of the uh, direction of the arrow these days. But you know, just from the title of the conference, from neuroscience to artificial intelligence systems, uh, you know, speaks to the the arrow that Blake was talking about. Do you agree that um, that there? Well, first of all, there's lots of things. So, so uh, what, what Tony was talking about, uh, the original inspiration, you know, trying to bring that back. Do you agree that it went away? That it's that uh, the AI community uh, doesn't appreciate neuroscience, and then also in your own work. Um, you seem to be, you know, uh, going the normal way, the modern normal way from AI to neuroscience. Uh, do you have aspirations to, to go to reverse that arrow? Sorry, that's oh. like seven questions. <laughs> that's a lot of questions. Yeah. So first, I should say, I've, I've never attended this nice, nicest conference before. So I'm super excited. Um, I'm not totally sure what to expect, except that I'll meet some incredibly smart people thinking about this question of, you know, how brains can inspire machines and uh, vice versa, how machines can inform our understanding of brains. I, I, I can't, I, I don't know the, the history, what you know, people in AI have been thinking the last 10 years. I, I think some of them have been deeply interested in the brain throughout, right? I think Jeff Hinton has always like saw himself first as someone who, his goal is to understand the brain. Is, is, is that not yeah, right? But if I can, hundred well, percent. And, and yeah. let me say there, there has always been the, the remaining core community in the AI world that believes in the need for taking inspiration from neuroscience. The misfits? Fact, huh? The misfits no, and actually, rogues? I, I think it's actually some of the most influential yeah, people. It's, it's, I think it's precisely the most influential people are the ones who um, do keep paying attention to neuroscience. I mean, Jeff 100%. Hinton, clearly, Jan LeCun, clearly, Yashua Bengio clearly cares. I think, um, you know, so, so, so the, the people who have made many of the major uh, advances actually were paying attention. 
Yes. I, I think that what is lost is for the younger generation. I mean, uh, sort of modern AI has become such a large field on its own that it sort of feels like it's self-contained. I think that's, that's really the, the, the issue. It, it's almost as if one were to, um, you know, try to, try to, try to, um, make it fundamental advances, let's say, in electrical engineering without quite understanding, um, the underlying physics. Yeah. I, I can, I, I also, I want to add to that because I think there's a funny dynamic that has come about because of the fact that, as Tony said, the most influential people are, are the ones who still fundamentally both seek and believe in the need for inspiration from the brain. And that is that um, there's a large contingent, I feel like, of AI researchers who see themselves almost as like rebels or something like that for articulating the idea that we never need to look at brains. And this is the sort of like the cool thing to say, as it were, for some people, um, precisely because they, they, they see someone like Jeff Hinton or Yashua Bengio say, oh, brains are critical inspiration for AI. And they're like, no, 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 that... You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna show that's nonsense. These old guys don't know what they're talking about. And so I have many interactions with young researchers, and on some level, their skepticism I think is good. It, it's a healthy to be skeptical of what the older generation tells you. But it's um, always funny for me when I have conversations with some really young people in the tech world, and they say to me, "Wow, you know, none of this really has anything to do with brains. It's all just matrix multiplication and stuff." And, Meanwhile, you know, I, a part of me wants to sit down and say, well, listen up, Sonny Jim, let's let's do a history lesson here <laughs> and go through the entire process with them. So what's funny is that I think that many AI people have left the neuroscience stuff to the side. And some of them see that as a sort of like bold rebellion against the old guard. Oh, I was just going to say, Tony, I mean, this also relates very much to your, your um, famous essay, right? I mean, you know, we shouldn't ignore these hundreds of millions of years of evolution. Like the brain has figured out so much structure and we, we should, you know, <laughs> we would get a huge leap if we can, we can figure out what those structures are, right? What are those fundamental structures that enable intelligence? Like, it just seems ridiculous to, to ignore that. I mean, like, why? Totally. You know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, like, that, that's what, that's what, to be honest, that's what really keeps me up at night. It's, it's the idea that, you know, it's, it's, it's like if we want to achieve faster than light travel and some aliens plunk down a spaceship capable of faster than light travel, right? We would sit there trying to reverse engineer that spaceship to figure it out, right? So we have that. We are surrounded by creatures that have solved the problems that we're trying to solve, not just humans, but animals, simple animals who are outperforming us, worms, flies, bees, spiders, uh, my dog, rats, they're all outperforming many, many, many things that we wish, we only wish we could, we could um, build machines to do. And some of them are so simple, and we still don't understand them. It's embarrassing, right? We, there's this, um, you know, this great, uh, car cartoon of a bunch of, um, of, uh, Lego pieces, right? And it's just an empty box and like, ah, okay, we, we have everything. We just need to figure out how to put them together, right? We know so much and yet we don't quite know how to put them together in, in the appropriate, uh, meaningful way. Um, so, yeah. so that, that's what, that's what, you know, it, it's just such an obvious source of, not just inspiration, but but specific guidance. Exactly. Yeah. When I was in in um, in graduate school, actually, like I think it was one of the first. It was a, a summer course at uh, MDL that I was at. You know, people were staying up late and <laughs> drinking, and you know, one, one very senior neuroscience respected neuroscientist was. Um, talking about how, you know, we were on the brink of understanding how the brain works. And he started prophesying the, the coming of the, he basically started prophesying the coming of the Messiah of neuroscience, <laughs> who would, who would, you know, sort of uh, reveal the truth to us. And, you know, maybe he, he had a, uh, he was, he was, uh, he had a little bit too much alcohol on board. And so he was 
you know, personifying it. But I think many of us feel like we're just on the brink. Like if only somebody could explain to us what we're missing, right? And some of us maybe even would have hoped to discover that missing thing. It's just so frustrating that we, we know so much and we don't quite know what we don't, what, you know, that missing piece. Yeah, I mean, you know, Blake was talking about this factorization between relations and, um, you know, what, what the object properties, right? And that, so that reminded me, I don't know if this is how you think about it, Blake, but, you know, when you try to generate invariant representation, you kind of, you know, on the one hand, you're saying that this thing that's transformed is the same. So you're extracting those invariant features. At the same time, you want to know what that transformation is, right? You know, did it yes. rotate? Did it expand? And um, so I, I think that, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I think a lot of this structure that's somehow built in through these, you know, this genome that's specifying the wire diagram is to extract the 3D world, right? The, the geometric aspects, like how things transform, like being able to deal with that. Because once you have that, then you can, you know, do unsupervised learning, all of that, right? Because you can track this object and you have like suddenly, you know, millions, billions of training samples for free. So I, I, that, that's my, my hunch is like a lot of it, like if we can understand that, um, well, we'll go a long way. So I really resonate with Blake there. And um, yeah. <laughs> One thing I'd say about that though, and I, I think this gets at um, where Tony's essay has influenced my thinking a bit more. And I think um, is really an important thing to remember when we're talking about inspiring AI with the brain is precisely as Doris kind of gestured at there, these, these systems, if we think about the visual system for a moment, you know, it has surely been optimized over the course of evolution. Uh, to engage in exactly that kind of invariant representation for the object. And then you have your representations of the spatial relations and stuff. So the object can rotate and it doesn't look different to you. And this is all built into our genomes. But, you know, because I, I suspect that there's some of that in animals the instant they're born. But then on top of that, there's some a, a whole layer of supervised, unsupervised learning, sorry, unsupervised learning throughout the early life that takes those underlying inductive biases that help us to segregate out kind of constant objects and relations between objects and stuff, and then can do a lot more learning on top of that so that we can learn really particular features of particular objects. And, you know, this is how a cat moves. This is how a ball moves. This is the nature of, you know, uh, playing with a spinning top, et cetera. And, and, and all of those, particular relations and properties that hold for the unique objects that evolution couldn't necessarily have known about in advance are what we learn through unsupervised learning. But that's all done on the base of a fundamental, very strong inductive bias to have these in invariant representations of constant objects and relations between them in a 3D world. Since you mentioned uh, Tony's paper, I, we don't need to make the whole uh, conversation focused on this. But so I, I recently had Robin Heisinger on the podcast. I think it may have been last episode, actually. He's the author of The Self Assembling Brain. And um, the way that it's sort of pitted generally is there's evolution, there's innateness, right? So we come into the world and there's the structure, um, it, but, which is encoded in the DNA somehow, right? And then there's learning on top of it. But his argument is that uh, what we are forgetting, which is a <clears throat> impossibly uh, complex myriad of um, information unfolding, is what he calls it, is that during from genes to the connectome, that developmental process is a crucial missing aspect. Um, and he kind of considers it um, an algorithm from the DNA to the connectome, because our DNA can't specify the entire connectome, right? But then uh, then on top of that, there's learning. So do we need to consider development or can we really just figure out the stru the right structure uh, and build that innate structure in the connectome in, or in the case of artificial networks in there? Uh, I, I mean, I think it's, yeah, I think it's clear that the way you get, I mean, it's not just clear, it's that the sort of way that, that biologists think about it, that the way you get from a genome to a any physical structure is via development. And the, the observation that the amount of information in the genome is orders of magnitude lower than the amount of information in the connectome implies that there have to be actually relatively simple rules for going from 
uh, genome to connectome. And those are developmental rules. Now, on top, of the, so some of those rules are, are um, going to be like activity dependent. And it's those activity dependent rules probably that over the course of evolution got sort of co-opted and formed the basis for activity dependent learning. In fact, from uh, a, a neuroscientist point of view, at least from a synaptic neuroscientist point of view, it's sometimes pretty hard to distinguish mechanisms for development from mechanisms for learning. You know, uh, LTP, long-term potentiation, is the leading candidate synaptic mechanism for uh, learning and memory. But in fact, some of the uh, earliest results in LTP were in development. So it's, it's really, there is no sharp distinction from an organism's point of view uh, between uh, mechanisms of development and mechanisms of learning. Now, some of the very earliest mechanisms of development um, are, are clearly distinct. Neurogenesis and things like that probably are, um, you know, and also laying out the, the, the basic wiring diagram of a neural circuit don't necessarily depend on, on activity. But for the most part, you know, learning and development, they go hand in hand in biology and, and the distinction between them is kind of artificial. Yeah, I would 100% agree with that. And I think that Tony made another really interesting point there, which is that what we call learning is probably a series of other mechanisms related to general developmental properties of the nervous system that got co-opted over the course of evolution and which somehow in mammals and some birds and stuff got linked into specifically um, things like error reduction mechanisms. And, and that was what then transitioned us towards what we might call learning in the proper sense of it. The proper sense. So there's a bias right there, right? <laughs> well, okay. So here's, here's, I guess, what I would say about, you know, where I distinguish learning from other activity dependent properties. And this goes back to work I did in my PhD, uh, where I was doing a lot of work on synaptic plasticity and tadpoles. And whenever we would show changes in the tadpole's visual system as a result of, you know, activity dependent processes, people would always ask, well, how do we know that that's uh, not just, you know, some program that the genome has built in it, but which needs some activity to unroll? And the answer was always, well, we look for specifically stimulus instructed changes. So if you can show that the nature of the changes depend not just on you know there being activity but on specifically the stimulus you show the animal and so if you show different stimuli you get different results in terms of how the brain develops then you've got something that's you know arguably learning because it's actually reflecting the animal's experiences rather than it being simply a gate that opens to allow for the developmental program to unroll blake i was going to ask you about this anyway so um Going off of what you just said, I was curious, uh, you know, and Tony, um, you brought up LTP and synaptic mechanisms of learning. What, what your take is on the new uh, dynamical uh, fad where you're looking at manifolds changing and um, neural activity uh, progressing through a manifold low dimensional space and that learning can take place in the dynamics of the network, um, that it's not all plasticity based. Are you on board with, with this story? Well, I'm certainly on board with it. And I mean, I think we've known that for a long time because there are certain types of tasks that you don't need long-term potentiation for. And, and so therefore it has to be something other than synaptic plasticity on some level, right? Um, and the dynamics is a reasonable place to start. I think that uh, the, you know, my favorite demonstration of that was actually a paper from Jane Wang and Matt Botvinnik where they do meta-learning in a neural network and a deep neural network. But the meta-learning, quote-unquote, is interesting because the inner loop was actually just dynamics of activity. And they show that if you, if you train the network such that the dynamics of acti activity represent your sort of plasticity in the inner loop, and then you've got your outer loop where you actually change your synaptic connections, you can end up recapitulating a lot of really fascinating experimental evidence related to how animals and people 
use their prefrontal cortex to solve a whole host of problems. Um, so that's just one example paper, and there's been a few around for a while. So I think that trend is is you know gaining steam precisely because on some level there's there's something really real there. Well, I had the I was up uh, too late the other night, and I had the thought that maybe the quote unquote <laughs> learning you talked about what proper learning that the learning that's taking place in the dynamics uh, may not be considered learning per se, but just movement among an inductive bias that's already built in, right? Uh, and that inductive bias is built in through the synaptic connection weights, right? So it's it's like we can, we have these uh, capabilities of um, moving along the dynamical uh, manifold landscape, to throw some jargon out there, uh, but we can only move into spaces that um, already exist. We're, it's not like true, quote unquote, learning that's happening because we're already set up. We already have those available spaces to um to visit well what what makes that less learning like than any other kind of learning well i I think pretty much we we can only learn things that we can learn right Right. like you know a a quintessential (laughs) example of things that we can learn uh of a thing we can learn is is language and yet you know i i believe that we have uh circuits that predispose us to learn language. Now, you know, the details of the specific language we learn, you know, depend on the language that we're exposed to. And and it's hard to articulate exactly what it is that is common among all languages, but but still, I mean, it, I think it's pretty clear we have some some if you like innate circuitry that enables us to acquire a language very quickly, and there are some slots there, some some free parameters that get filled pretty quickly over the course of the first few years of life that allow us to acquire sounds and words and, and basic syntax and, and, and grammar. Yep. Yeah. Also, I would say I'm from the experimental side, you know, there's some ex- amazing experiments being done with BMIs to, to see the you know capacity for the brain to learn. I think it's like really, for me, at least it was kind of shocking that you can, you know, set up a BMI. So um, like a mouse can learn, um, to control a cursor based on the activity of pretty much like any neuron, you know, an arbitrary chosen set of neurons, right. In, in, in some arbitrary piece of brain, like they can control a cursor by controlling that activity, like that they could learn to do that was, it was pretty shocking to me. And I, you know, it sort of goes against this idea that you're only able to learn very specific uh, things. But in that case, so just continuing on my late night thought experiment uh, in that case, couldn't you argue that the mouse already had the, um, ability to make those movements, right? So it can't ex- it can't explore some completely novel um, way of of mapping. It. So in my thought experiment, uh, it would require like actual changes in the uh, synaptic structure, right? In, in the um, connections between the units, because you could say that well, the mouse already had the ability to um, visit those those uh, spaces and already had visited those spaces probably right throughout time. So it's it's not that challenging to remap the population um, dynamics to that space. Does that make sense? I don't know why I'm arguing about this. It's, this is about you, not me, about you guys, not me. So I'm sorry. To me, it's still pretty stunning. Like you choose like an arbitrary set of neurons, the, like they, they, who knows what they're actually coding and you can just get the mouse to use those the activity in those neurons to control this thing. It suggests something about incredible flexibility, right? You, you mentioned remapping. There has to be some kind of remapping, and you know, whatever the mechanism is, that has to be incredibly flexible. And it gets us this question: you know, how do you, how how does the brain do this dynamic routing, right? Like like I tell you, you know, um, Paul, if you if you you know see me at Nysis, like give me a hug, and, and if you remember that, like you've suddenly made a connection from, you know, your face cell representing me to, to your, you know, cells representing hugging. And, and it's a dynamic connection that the, that connection has never happened before. Like how on earth do you do that? It, but I, I've not hugged many people, Doris, but I have hugged people. So that's within the realm of my current ca- capabilities, right? Yeah. But to wire it so specific for me is like the, the magic part. And I, I just want to say something that I think gets at what you're trying to push at, Paul which is, and this ties back to Tony's first answer to you as well, all learning systems are constrained on what they can learn. There there is no such thing as a learning system that's not constrained on what it can learn. And in fact, you know, this has been proven mathematically with the no free lunch theorems. Exactly. If if a learning system 
truly has no prior on what it can learn. It basically just learns everything poorly. So to get good learning, you necessarily have to constrain your system to learn well in certain areas. And in this way, um, you know, if we show that, say, brains have certain restrictions placed on the sorts of things they can learn, uh, that's unsurprising. That would almost, it would be more surprising if that didn't exist. And that's where I agree with Doris's point, which is that sometimes it's shocking the things that brains apparently can learn, in my opinion, when it seems like it shouldn't necessarily be something that's learnable, that like, why would we not be constrained to, to learn that? And, you know, I, I suppose I think different species have different degrees of this. And so for me, I think humans are remarkably adept at learning a surprisingly large number of arbitrary things. And, but that doesn't mean that we're not constrained. We're very much so still constrained. It's just that it's surprising how arbitrary it can be. Yeah. But just to circle back to the question that you asked a while ago about, do I hate learning and how much do I hate learning? Um, you love to be this guy, I mean, though. I know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, obviously, I personally hate learning things. But, but, but I think that the, the, so the point that I was trying to make in that essay was not that learning isn't a thing that exists, but that a great deal of what non-neuroscientists sometimes imagine depends on learning probably doesn't depend on learning by an individual over the course of his or her lifetime. And that we are biased by paying attention to humans who probably learn way more than almost any other animal, probably more than any other animal. But even we don't learn as much as we think we do. But animals, most animals, don't actually require a great deal of learning to, to function properly. So they're capable of learning. But if you look at most insects, they can't afford to spend their first couple months figuring out how the world works, right? They come out of whatever it is that insects come out of, and they're, they're pretty much ready to roll, right? Or fly or bite or crawl or do whatever they're going to do. Yeah. I mean, you know, I have colleagues who study learning in Drosophila. And so, you know, flies are capable of learning. Uh, and that certainly is adaptive. But many of the things that we're impressed at, that um, insects and frankly, even mammals do, probably doesn't require a great deal of learning. In fact, probably maybe just a, a bit of fine tuning to the environment. So, you know, you watch a squirrel jumping from tree to tree, that squirrel didn't like figure out de novo how to jump from tree to tree. Like all squirrels learn to do it pretty well. And, and I think I just want to note something because I think there's this misperception that there's a big divide on this question. <laughs> Tony has actually convinced me of this point. And, and I really don't think that it's incorrect to say that for the vast majority of species, a lot of the learning that has occurred, quote unquote, was actually optimization over the course of evolution. I think that um, what is maybe sometimes misunderstood about this argument, though, and, and Tony or Doris, you can disagree with me if, if, if you do on this point, is that that doesn't mean that then for AI, the message is hardwired human engineered features. Because the the problem the, agree. the the mental jump that people are making there is they're saying okay animals have a lot of innate machinery therefore we should give ai innate machinery but they're forgetting that animals innate machinery was delivered courtesy of an optimization routine rather than a human engineer and this is the problem because human engineers suck at delivering the kind of things that you need for ai that's what we discovered over the course yep 50 years of failed AI research. So, you know, although everything that is Tony saying is true, animals have all this innate machinery and, you know, a squirrel probably doesn't, they tweak whatever existing programming is there in order to learn how to jump from tree to tree. That doesn't then mean that the solution to AI is for us to sit down and try to be like, hmm, okay, let's think through absolutely. it. Absolutely. No, I think, I think that's absolutely right. Like we have this innate machinery and if we're going to try to engineer it, the solution isn't so, so far we, we were, we were given two choices, right? 
One choice is to hand engineer those features either by using your imagination or possibly by looking at the uh, engineered features from animals. That's choice one. And choice two is to learn them de novo each time you train a system. And I'm arguing there's a, a third uh, route, which is you, you lay a foundation of these sort of useful prior, right? And maybe you get them through uh, an optimization algorithm. And frankly, you know, just because evolution got them through an evolutionary algorithm doesn't mean that that's exactly the algorithm we need to use. So in fact, you know, evolution is a lousy algorithm, right? Because it doesn't use a gradient. Evolution worked because it operated over, I once tried to do a back of the envelope calculation on this, like 10 to the, uh, 10 to the 30 individuals have contributed to um, our, our genome, even with really fast C GPUs. It's going to be a while before we can uh, sort of simulate 10 to the 30 uh, organisms and use the outcome of that as the basis of, um, of, of our, of our system. So no, I mean, the, the insight that we had was that gradients are really useful for finding your way around the high dimensional, uh, space, right? So if we're going to engineer, if we're going to recapitulate evolution, right, we're probably, uh, going to have to do it using gradients. Exactly. But then the idea is that we shouldn't have to redo that each and every time. We train a network. We should sort of figure out some kind of collection of foundational structures, right? Each time we train a network, uh, usually, and you know, there's been some recent work on, on, you know, not starting from scratch each time, especially with, uh, language networks, because there basically we have no choice, right? Cause, you know, training one of these causes the, the lights to dim in Boston for a couple of days. It requires that much energy and compute. So it, 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 it seems like at some point you can't keep retraining from scratch each time. But I, I think that that the, the lesson there is, is far more general and we have to sort of figure out how to reuse the training that we've done over and over again in, in a, in a useful way. So, you know, when, when I was a kid, we used to, um, uh, stump each other by asking, do you walk to school or carry your lunch? And I, it's a false dichotomy, right? The, the choice between learning and um, exploiting innate structures is a false dichotomy. The answer is we should do both. Do you think, though, we're anywhere near understanding the capacity? So thinking about the high dimensional structure, right, um, of, you know, 86 billion neurons. But do you think that we are near, uh, anywhere near appreciating um, the actual heavy, li heavy lifting that evolution has done to uh, create that a particular high dimensional space, right? Where are these amazing general uh, learning things and it's amazing the different types of things that we can learn and recombine. But uh, on the other hand, constraint, like Blake was saying, is super important. And do we, do we appreciate that high dimensional structure enough or do we think, okay, it's so high dimensional, it can just do anything? I think most people would recognize the importance of the high dimensional structures that have been optimized by evolution for the unique properties of human thought. And certainly anyone who's tried optimizing neural networks for any lengthy period of time will appreciate just how amazing the product that evolution has produced is. Because you can get a lot of really cool, funky, amazing behaviors with gradient descent, but getting the unique mix that you see in, in animals in general, not just people, is turning out to be remarkably difficult. And so um, I think anyone who, who has spent some time with them and with these, these optimization procedures will respect evolution's contribution quite a bit. Yeah, and there's a, you, know, you, you guys have been talking about how you can build, you know, use evolution to build the most powerful machines. Um, you know, as a neuroscientist, my, my interest is really to understand the brain and um, like there's different ways of understanding, right? There's, there's like this fad right now of, you know, um, regressing activity of neurons to units in deep networks. That's one type of understanding. You know, I think the deep understanding is going to, it's going to require understanding those structures, right? It's sort of like um, if you take a simpler example, you know, can calculate what, what is the probability of getting two heads and a tail if you flip a coin three times, right? 
So you could figure that out by doing a Monte Carlo simulation. You could figure that out by writing out all the outcomes, right? H, H, T, H, T, T, so on. Or you could figure that out by actually understanding the structure of the binomial distribution. And I think all of us would agree that the last form of understanding is this you know, real understanding. <laughs> and so similarly, like just, just taking a neural network, like that's not going to, and, and regressing and saying it explains whatever percent variance, like that, that's not totally satisfying, right? I, I agree with that. And I just want to say, I think sometimes um, there is an unfortunate tendency for people to think of the contribution that uh, machine learning can make to neuroscience as being fully encapsulated by that approach that just regresses neural activity uh, against deep neural networks. And I think that provides us a bit of understanding, as Doris said, but in my mind, that is only really effective in a tool for as a tool for gaining understanding if you're using it to answer other questions with the neural network. So simply showing that you have a network that you can regress well against the data is itself not necessarily that informative. It doesn't tell you nothing, but it, it, it's not necessarily that informative. But instead, what you want to do is you then want to use those models to, as it were, understand the distribution and to try to think about the principles by which you can get models that are better fits to brains. Um, and, and it's only by taking that principled approach and using these models as normative guides that we get to something like real understanding. Simply doing the regressing itself is not, I agree with Doris, sufficient for understanding. And it's also not, and this is ultimately my point, the entirety of the program that, you know, or neural networks and machine learning and neuroscience have to offer neuroscientists. Exactly. And I think Tony's essay also, for me personally, like int introduced another dimension of understanding, right? Understanding how this genome encodes these structures that enable learning. Like, you know, I've and it's sort of always like festered in the back of my mind. You know, I heard this statistic that the genome, you know, you can put it on a CD-ROM or something. And it seemed kind of incredible, but I never, like Tony, like really worked out the implications of that, right? Like you have to specify all of these learning rules in that, in that um, CD. <laughs> So that's, um, yeah, like, like, I feel like if we're going to understand the brain, like we have to understand that question too, you know, like Mar had the famous three levels that this is, I feel like a fourth level, like how does this computational structure, how do you actually wire it up with, with a small amount of information? Yeah, in some sense, it's, I consider it good news because it means that the, specific, like the, there was one concern that I've always had is that the brain is just infinitely complicated. You know, there's this bag of tricks idea that basically it's just a collection of kludges. And al although there's clearly some of that going on, right, clearly a lot of specialized adaptation um, that you'll only understand if you really, really dig, 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 dig very deep, uh, the, the overall description length the, the, of the entire circuit is just not that long. And, you know, there's an upper limit, which is the size of the genome, but it's not being optimally used in some sense. And not all of the genome is used to specify the brain. So, you know, the, the difference between, actually, I did another calculation. The difference between a um, human brain and a uh, macaque brain actually does fit on an old school floppy disk. So it's, you know, of order one megabyte. Doris doesn't know what you're talking uh, about, but okay. <laughs> um, so... Uh, you know, it's, I think it's good news that the things that make us special as humans, it's really not that much, right? Now, you know, one megabyte of stuff could actually have a huge impact, but to figure out what that, to, to, to write it down, it turns out probably not to be so hard. Well, this is why I brought up development earlier. And um, I, I mean, I'm just unbiased because of my recent conversation with people like Robin Heisinger um, and well, other people I've had on the uh, on the podcast recently, Kevin Mitchell, for instance, um, that the their argument is that we're actually missing like what is actually specified in the genome isn't the rules for connections; it is the rules for development, and that through the developmental process, that algorithm actually changes. It's the same thing. Yeah, right? six like, one like, half dozen of the other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, okay. that's implicit in saying it's not. So it's clear that we will not like dig into the genome and suddenly find the part where you can unpack the matrix that reflects the, you know, the connectivity. I don't, you know, not, not, not the recent movie, but the, 
uh, connectivity matrix uh, among among neurons, right? Like we're not going to ah there, you know, let's just do G zip on this. No, it's not. Um, it's not simply a bunch of, of synaptic weights, even probably in C. elegans, where you could actually just list all the weight, C. elegans being a worm, there's 302 neurons and 7,000 synapses, right? That even though the C. elegans genome is a little smaller than ours, um, that connectivity matrix for the uh, circuit, the entire brain circuit of the worm C. elegans would fit comfortably into the genome, but that's still not how it's done. Right. So developmental rules are, you know, interesting and complicated, but they're rules. Right. So at no point would you expect to find a list of connections within uh, w w within a genome. So I, I, I think I think we're all in agreement that the way you get from genomes to circuits is via interesting developmental rules, um, whether that. Whether understand, like, I think understanding those rules is fascinating, uh, in its own right. Whether that will be the path to understanding, um, you know, the computational roles of neural circuits. I don't know. I'm, I am getting increasingly interested in development in the hopes that maybe it will provide insight. But, you know, there, there are possibly many ways of figuring out how to, to make a brain that, that computes or how, how computation in the brain is, is sort of instantiated in the circuit. Tony, how's your paper aged? I had you on, the, it was like two years ago or something. I don't remember. It was forever ago. Uh, but, yeah, um, it was a long time ago. Yeah. Would you, do, would you have written anything differently in the paper at this point, or do you still stand by the original message? And I, I still you and stand by it. it. It sort of laid down the, um, certainly the path that my lab is going to be taking in this, in this domain. So, you know, that was, a, you know, it was an essay. It was full of uh, ideas and observations, but not actual work. But for me, like the research program that uh, is suggested by it is to figure out how to actually compress a, an artificial neural network wiring diagram into a quote unquote uh, genome. And that when you ask, you know, what am I thinking about? That's on a day to day basis, what I'm thinking about. And, you know, that, that's the nitty gritty of it. And it's been, um, it, it's been a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun, um, to see how we can do that. So, um, but I think, I think there's, you know, if I were to add, and I've been talking to actually Blake about this recently, is to think a little bit harder about the role of evolution in all this. I, I think, um, you know, how to actually fit that in is, like I, I don't have a, a, a clear idea yet, but in terms of a path forward, um, that that's something that that I've certainly been thinking a lot about. Do we understand evolution itself well enough to think about those things? I feel like we understand the principles of evolution pretty well. You know, it's for me the biological equivalent to Newtonian mechanics. It is the core insight that allowed us to build all the rest of the conceptual scaffolding and general approach to doing the science. And so, you know, I'm sure there are still tons of things that people are learning about evolutionary processes every day, but the fundamental mechanism is very clear and, and we can simulate it. We can show that you get all sorts of interesting things that, you know, are explain a variety of facets of biological life and, um, so though there's more to discover, I think if, if we don't admit to knowing, to understanding something about evolution, then I'm not sure what we do understand. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. All right. As, as organizers of the NISIS uh, conference this year, um, I will just put your feet to the fire. Where do you guys think, complete speculation, of course, where do you think we are on the fad curve of what what is sometimes called neuro AI? That is, well, That's go ahead. Hardly a fad. I would say that it's just the opposite. It's uh, after a neuro AI winter, we are experiencing um, the the neuro AI spring. So we're returning to uh, you know we're returning to our roots. So it's I think that it deserves 
I think neuroscience deserves to be a part of AI and vice versa. And we're just hopefully going to going to catalyze that that return. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think the, the only caveat I'd add, and this is why sometimes you can talk about fads. And I say this with all due respect to anyone in California listening or here on the call. Um, sometimes the, the fad machine that people are picking up on is not what's going on in academia or even industrial research, but the fad machine that is what comes out of Silicon Valley venture capital culture and stuff like that. And, and there, I think we probably have passed an inflection point. If you just look at the number of searches online for deep learning, it's down from a few years ago. If you look at the extent to which people are throwing money at anyone who says they have a company that does deep learning, that's down from a few years ago. So there's some business cycle fad that maybe is slightly on the wane. But I think the long-term business trend, and certainly as Tony articulated, the long-term scientific endeavor is, is not a fad, has never been a fad, and will continue to pick up pace as we start to figure more and more out. Agree, Doris? I completely agree. I mean, I, I feel like this, this neuro AI is as fundamental as, you know, physics or chemistry. It's, you know, the study of intelligence, perception, all of these um, things that some of us, you know, that's what, what we care about. It's, um, it's so fundamental. Like it's, you know, there, there's certainly like fads, I mean, in, in how you analyze data using neural networks and so on, that's all true. But um, yeah, the fundamental quest to understand intelligence, uh, I don't see how that can be called a fad. All right. One last question. I know you guys have to go uh, for each of you. Do the problems that you are working on, do they feel bigger or do they feel smaller than when you began working on them or as, as you continue to work on them? For me, they definitely feel that they're so much bigger. You know, when I first started recording from face cells, the question was like, what, what drives this face cell? You know, is it the eyes, is it the shape of the face or so on? And we've pretty much figured that out. You know, the cells are driven by shape and appearance features. Um, so now we're asking questions like, you know, how does the brain generate a conscious percept of a face? Or, you know, can the brain, how do you imagine a face? Um, how, do you, how do you learn a face in an unsupervised way? Well, it's a um, whole, whole new realm of questions. So. Yeah, when, when I started graduate school, I had this, this fear that um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't train up fast enough um, and that by the time I sort of understood enough to do useful work, all the problems would be solved. <laughs> so that, that turned out not to be quite as big a problem as I thought. <laughs> uh, so in that sense, the problems seem uh, constantly to get bigger. I, I thought the problem was pretty small when I started. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I thought that it was kind of like training up as a physicist in the late in the mid twenties, right? Like, because there was this sudden moment where, you know, everything got figured out in quantum mechanics. And if, if, if you got your degree in, you know, 1929, you'd miss the boat. I figured that that's how it was going to be. Uh, turns out we haven't, we haven't quite uh, hit that inflection point yet. So the problems remain as bigger, bigger than when I started graduate school. Blake, I'd love to hear a dissenting voice here that there are all the problems seem tiny now. <laughs> I'm afraid I can't give you that kind of dissent. I mean, what I'll say though is um, I think that as the field matures, uh, what's interesting is that you get to the point where though the problems can seem bigger and are bigger, you feel, at least me, I feel a little bit more like I have some of the conceptual tools to tackle them. And so Though it seems like there's more work to do and the problems are bigger, I don't feel the same sense of like, well, how the hell are we going to do this at all? That I felt maybe like, you know, 15 years ago when I was starting my uh, graduate school, like that's, that's a radically different scenario that way um, to feel like we actually have some of the conceptual and experimental tools necessary to tackle these problems that do indeed seem bigger to me now. Well, considering that uh, 99.999% of the organisms couldn't be with us today because of that bastardly evolutionary uh, optimization algorithm, I really appreciate uh, this little sliver of humanity being with me. Thanks, guys, for joining me. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time. The stair-